G'day, and thanks for joining me. Tonight, I'm going to be reading some true stories from the outback. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a scare. Many major towns and cities in Australia are generally hours apart by car, and sometimes days. And in the outback, you won't even see a fuel station for hundreds of miles. This happened a few years ago, in 2014 or 15. So I was driving back from visiting my family with my mum, who was recovering from some medical stuff at the time and couldn't drive. We were taking a break on the last leg of the journey when I noticed I had a message from a friend called Ryan that was visiting my hometown asking if I could try to grab some important mail from his house on my way. I say try because it had been raining heavily at the time, and his property was mostly cut off from the roads. If it had been any other friend, I would have politely declined as my mother was there, but she was feeling good, and Ryan had known our family for years, and was there to keep my mum company in the hospital. So we said why not, let's give it a try. We already knew the main road off the highway would be closed, so we headed for the back roads in our little Mazda 323. We get a few k's into the area and it starts pissing down with a fury. We go back and the roads are already flooded, so I decided we'll just hole up into Ryan's house until the roads clear. There was plenty of food there and a generator for power. So now we had the task of driving through a bunch of paddocks to get to his house. It's still raining and I have to get out now and to open the gate. But despite everything, we're laughing and having fun. We pull up to the second last gate and we're singing along to Fleetwood Mac. I open the gate and get back in the car, still singing. We're really into it and haven't pulled away yet when I hear a bang on the back of the car. I turn the music down and a second later, there's a man banging on my window. Mum screams like a banshee. I'm kind of frozen, just staring at this guy for what feels like a full minute. A second later, we're driving way too fast across the paddock. It doesn't take long to get to the final gate, and I haven't even had time to process what the fuck just happened back there. I glance over at mum as I'm slowing down, and they just jam the handbrake, jump out of the car, and haul ass across to the gate. And you better believe, that shit got left open. We get to the house maybe a minute later, run inside, and lock the doors. Mum calls the police, while I call Ryan to ask if he was expecting visitors. The police couldn't arrive until late the next day, and they found nothing of interest. Ryan suspected a squatter he had called the cops on once before, but whatever the case, this man shouldn't have been anywhere near Ryan's property, and therefore it freaked the hell out of me and my mum. So trust and believe, I'll never be going to Ryan's place to get any mail, ever again. My mum, two aunts and I were heading back to our hometown in the outback from one of Australia's capital cities just after my other aunt had given birth to a third child. Due to complications, she had to be flown down to receive treatment by medics in the city. I was a sulky little shit at 11 and begged to go with my mum and aunts to see her. It took a while, but they eventually agreed to let me tag along. So it was around lunchtime and my mum decided it was time to get something to eat. My mum and aunts are health nuts. So instead of going to Macca's or Hungry Jack's, which is Australian Burger King, they decided to go to the nearest shopping mall and get a few sandwiches. I wasn't feeling a sandwich for lunch, so it caused the biggest fuss and refused to get out of the car. Mum, who was pretty much over my shitty attitude, just told me to stay in the car. Before everyone starts commenting about leaving kids in the car, let me just say that it was the beginning of spring, so it wasn't hot at all inside or outside of the car. In fact, it was rather cold because I remember I had a jumper on and trackies on that day. Anyway, she and my aunt got me to lock the doors of the car and gave me the normal stranger danger talk before heading into the shopping centre. About three minutes after they had left, I jumped into the middle back seat. Just a side note, the car we had was a seven seat four wheel drive with tinted windows and being that I was the only kid on this trip, I sat in the seat in the far back. The seat that I jumped into was the seat behind the driver's and passenger's seat. So back to the story. After I moved, I for some reason turned to my left and saw a lady around mid thirties with a red sweater and short black hair in the car next to ours, just looking at me. We locked eyes for a few seconds and I kind of felt a little awkward, 
and decided to lay down on the seat to avoid the lady. I had a blanket with me and my discman, you remember those? And chilled out listening to music to the latest So Fresh CD that I had purchased the day before. I started to drift off to sleep when I started to feel the car shake. I opened my eyes and saw the most frightening thing I'd ever seen. There, next to my window, was a man dressed in all black and wearing a mask, trying to get into the car. I did the only thing I could do. I hid under the blanket and prayed that someone, anyone, would see what was going on and help me. Not long after I hid, I heard a woman's voice talking to the man. Her voice was very clear, so it was evident to me that she was the woman I had locked eyes with earlier. She then said to the man, Adrian, don't worry about the car, we'll just take this one. After she said that, the guy stopped trying to get into my car and started threatening her. I don't really want to repeat what exactly was said, but I will say that this sick bastard described in detail exactly what he was going to do to her once they got back to her house if she didn't shut up. His words still haunt me to this day. When I was young, I lived in quite a small town in Queensland. The whole town was surrounded by bush in every direction for hundreds of kilometres, and we had so much room to play. This particular story is about the first time we got drunk. In the winter, the level of water would drop significantly, enough for us to camp in the riverbed. My best mate's parents owned a pub at the time, so we were in charge of getting the drinks for a little camping trip we had planned, so we could finally pop our drunk cherry. The place we had in mind was near an old indigenous settlement where a few creepy things have happened to us over time. So we made our way down there into the riverbank which was low on the side where we came in and really high on the other side. You couldn't see on the other side through all the trees on the top and it was kind of unnerving knowing someone could be up there watching you and you just wouldn't know. There were about seven of us kids in the camp and our parents have no idea what we're doing or where we are. We lied and said we're staying at a friend's place. We set up our camp, and we built a little shelter for all of us to sleep under. We were all set up and started drinking as the sun is setting. Soon it's dark and we're in full swing of mixing drinks and singing songs and throwing stuff in the water. All of that shenanigan. And generally making a whole heap of noise. And as we're starting to wind down, one of my friends say he saw something move at the top of the riverbank, on the steep side. We all say he's full of shit and should calm down, but he's adamant that there's someone up there. So we all start calling out, Come out, you pussy, and other such things. Being brave well beyond our years. To our surprise, a bearded man wearing straggly clothes and no shoes came out of the tree line. He stands on the edge of the bank and just stares at us. We all go silent, waiting for him to do something for about five minutes. But he just stands there. And then he retreats back into the tree line. We all talk amongst ourselves and get a bit nervous, but soon we forget about it. About an hour later, the guy's back, but he isn't on the bank anymore. He's coming out of the shadows from the other side of the bank and entering our camp. He comes over and stands next to the fire, just joins our group of 12 year old kids and stands there. We're all officially fucking scared at the moment and don't really know what to do, so we just sit there in silence. Eventually, one of my friends gets up the courage to speak to him. G'day mate, how are ya? You okay? The guy just stares at my friend, and then starts staring at each of us in turn for a little bit. My friend tries again. Hey, you alright? What's your name? The man snaps his head back at my friend and stares at him wide-eyed for at least two minutes before answering. Without blinking, he says in a raspy whisper, that's none of your business. And he hisses like a cat. Then this guy just jumps back screaming and staring at the fire like it just appeared out of nowhere and runs out on the steep bank in record time. It was impossible to get up this thing so we all stand there, speechless. We decide that it's best if we just stoke the fire up because it's about a 19k walk in the pitch black back to town and we weren't confident on that. So stoke the fire we did. We sat up for as long as we could, keeping watch. No really talking. We all eventually dozed off one by one. When we woke up in the morning, 
Everything was gone. All of our alcohol, all of our bags, all of our shoes and all of our blankets. Everything. The creepy thing was that none of us awoke as someone robbed us blind and there was not a single footprint. We were sleeping in wettish sand so there should have been footprints everywhere, but there were none. It looked like we hadn't even been there. Needless to say, we bailed and ran most of the way back to town. Our feet were all cut up and messy by the time we got back. We never told our parents about our camping trip, and I don't think none of us ever will. I'm a 29 year old female, and this happened to me about four years ago. My family lived on a farm in rural outback Western Australia, just north of Geraldton, which is about a four hour drive from Perth and Miss Reality's home state. We lived in a modest looking wooden farmhouse. My son and I lived here alone most of the time while my husband worked on rotation up north in the mines. We had no neighbours, no cell phone reception and very little connection with the outside world with the exception of the TV. There was only one window in the house, situated above my bed in the bedroom. It was a small old wooden frame window with no curtains. However, the window was completely jammed and as much as I tried to close it, there was about two inches of opening near the bottom of the window frame. My husband and I had spent a while trying to oil the hinges and loosen it up the day before he left to go to work again. But we gave up because it was stuck and it was only a couple of inches. Fast forward to a couple of nights later. I'm standing in front of the TV doing the ironing and watching Sex in the City while my son is asleep in my bed. As I walk up the hallway to enter the laundry to grab another load of washing, I pass my bedroom and pop my head in to check on my son. My heart stops. The window frame above my bed is shuffling from side to side. My eyes scan down, and what I see next will never leave my mind again. There were two hands squeezed through the gap of my window, trying to lift up the jammed frame. I screamed the house down, grabbed my son, the phone, and locked myself in the bathroom and called for the police. Thankfully that person disappeared after my screaming, and police couldn't find any traces or fingerprints belonging to anyone that they knew. But I never felt safe in that place ever again, considering the circumstances of where we lived. So we moved to Perth shortly after. I was a tour guide and was doing my usual trip along the Stuart Highway. If you're not familiar with Australia, it's the longest and straightest highway in the world where you won't encounter a fellow soul on the road for hours. Civilization is so far away, you can't even use a phone as there's no phone reception. The only chance of communication is by CB radio. That's if anyone's around to hear it. So on to the story. I was driving a tour group northwards and was starting at the horizon when I saw two dark dots briskly approaching. As I neared the dots, I could see a tall, lean man with his dog. He seemed in a hurry, but I was trying to hide his face. I slowed down to double check if the man was alright, but the man kept on walking, completely ignoring any of my attempts at providing help or assistance. Rule number one on the Stuart Highway is to look out for one another. You keep other drivers informed if you spot trouble, such as roadkill or even animals feeding off it on the road. You offer a lift and maybe treatments if someone is stranded. This is because you can actually die in the outback. When you find someone who can help you, that might be often your only chance if you've ever broken down and aren't well prepared. I wanted to help the lone man, but I received no reply. Something was off about him. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but I had a bad feeling in my gut. I was about to drive off, but the whole bus was protesting. He might be dehydrated and out of his mind. He might need help after all, but I had the interest of the group at heart and I couldn't just take a total stranger and a possible weirdo. The tour group voiced their anger at this even louder, but I didn't relent. Once we arrived in town some hours later, I dropped off everyone and headed to the bar to catch up with my old mates who were expecting me. One of them arrived later than usual and he seemed flustered and upset. Concerned, I asked him what was up. He told me that he and his fellow officers had been investigating bloodshed in a small town. Several people had been brutally butchered to death and the perpetrator was on the run. 
even though they pretty much knew who he was, they couldn't locate him. He just disappeared. With a sudden intuition, I asked what he looked like, and the following description sent chills up and down my spine. It perfectly explained the man and the dog that I had seen and tried to help. The police had been searching in the wrong direction all this time as he had cleverly diverted them off his track. However, thanks to my tip, my mate was able to handcuff the armed murderer two hours later. But unfortunately, that wasn't the only weird one I had. On another recent tour, a weird man joined our group. He seemed entirely disinterested in what was happening around him, and he never spoke to anyone or got off the bus during photo stops. He even rejected the meals that were prepared during the tour. To be honest, I wasn't even sure if the guy was quite sane as he seemed to be startled really easily and stared into the distance mostly. One part of the tour is you can stop at Cooper Pedy, which is a rural town in South Australia, where they're known for being a town underground. It's so bloody hot there that everything is pretty much underground. Hotels, shops, all that sort of stuff. It's a really unique town. Anyway, so the man chose to have a nook all to himself. This meant four bunk beds and a curtain to separate the corner from the overall room. The next morning, I came to wake everyone. Everyone was mostly woken up except the nook which was separated off from everyone else where the strange man spent the night. I opened the curtains and gently announced, Good morning. I found the guy still asleep, but nearly settled him to death when I opened the curtains. I had stepped on newspaper that covered the whole area and the bunk beds. Why it was there, I didn't even want to know, but was mighty glad to be rid of the guy once we landed in Adelaide. The feeling seemed mutual because the guy was the first one off the bus and gone in an instant. Unfortunately, this wasn't the last time I saw that creepy guy again. As I lived in Adelaide and had just completed my tour, I returned home that night to enjoy a week off before I was rostered on the next tour. When I turned on the telly, I was just in time for the news. The creepy man that was on my tour bus was on the news. I recognized his face instantly. I watched him very carefully on the tour because I didn't trust him, so I'll never forget his face. To my horror, the man was a serial rapist and was still on the run. I was on a road trip with a mate, traveling around the central Queensland outback in my old semi-reliable Nissan X-Trail. It's also called the Nissan Rogue in North America. We're both science nerds and had heard about this amazing dinosaur trail out this way, which is basically a group of three areas, which is Winton, Richmond and Hewenden, that have previous dino bone discoveries, still have fossils as well as some very serious awesome dinosaur tracks with preserved foot imprints. We were staying at a place three hours from Winton for a couple of days and were pretty keen to check out this trail. So we made the decision to do the six hour round trip in a day. We were pretty ambitious and stupid back then, but anyway, we left at 9am the next morning car packed with lunch and several litres of water, plus my trusty GPS. It was a long drive, and halfway through, my bloody aircon decided to cark it. If any of you have lived or visited Australia in the summer, you know how brutally hot it gets. So I'm sure you can imagine the three hour trip without aircon, which eventually turned into a six hour round trip, was hell. To make matters worse, my GPS also stopped working as the map software didn't recognise the off-road area we were in. Luckily. I had an old reefer dex in my back seat, but it was pretty tough to revert to map reading when you're used to a computer screen telling you where to go. Especially given we're talking the Aussie outback here, complete with dirt track roads and very limited signage. But I digress. We finally make it to the trail and kick around there for a couple of hours, then decide to make the trip back as it was starting to get later in the afternoon and we didn't want to be driving in the dark. As we're about to leave, this gnarly old guy, who appeared to be an employee of the trail company, dressed in all khaki camouflage gear, asked about where we were from and where we were heading. He gave me the stink eye when I was vague with the details, but my mate told him the name of the town we were staying in. He seemed to take a real liking to my mate, and he laughed when he told him about our lengthy journey in. Apparently we had taken the um, air quote long route, and there was a much quicker way to get back, 
that should have shaved about an hour off the trip. We jumped at the directions he gave us, because we didn't have aircon anyway. Now these directions were all verbal, which we wrote down. So we eager to get out of there before it got too dark. We jumped in the car and got moving. We thought to ourselves, how lucky we were to meet this old dude who gave us some sweet intel and a shortcut home. But I couldn't deny there was definitely a creepy vibe coming off him. Probably the stink eye he gave me, but anyway. Based on the directions he gave us, we went winding along several roads in an area I'd never been in and eventually settled straight on this narrow dirt road. We were supposed to reach an intersection after about an hour, take a right, and continue on that road until we got to a main highway that would take us back. After about an hour and a half of driving on this dirt trail though, we still hadn't reached this supposed intersection. I was starting to freak out a bit, thinking we'd missed the turn, but my mate was completely chilled out and was so sure that we'd get there eventually. We'd been travelling for a while now and it was getting later and later in the day, and it got to the point where the petrol in the tank was only a quarter full. There were no houses, other roads or any other car in sight, and I wasn't really comfortable with where this was headed. The middle of nowhere, in a remote area, in the wasteland, that's the Australian outback. There weren't even any trees, only this dirt road and desolate, dry bushland or shrubs as far as the eye can see. I stop the car and tell my mate to get the binoculars out of the back to take a look around in case he can see a landmark. Yeah, I carry binoculars in my car and I still do. He obliges and can just make out a house-like structure not too far in the distance, so we made the decision to head for that. We figured it could be a house and maybe the people would be nice enough to give us some petrol to top us up and get some better directions out of there. As we neared the structure, it became apparent that this wasn't a house at all. We pulled up the front and see that it's an old caravan that's been burnt to a shell from the inside out. It's still got three black and partial walls up though, so we couldn't see all the way in and it looks like someone had been there recently because there were animal bones strung up all over the place and a cow skull at the entrance to the caravan. Some of the animal bone things even have grass or horse hair woven into them and they were arranged like decorations. Then we see this hand painted sign that's been staked to the ground with the words Moonlight Motel on it. My alarm bells are ringing loud and clear. And who the hell stays in a place like this? How is it a motel? It's only got three walls for freak's sakes. I nudge my friend and say let's GTFO. But he's distracted by something in the distance. It's a car. Coming in the direction we just come from. It would have only been about 10 minutes behind us the entire time we were driving, but I didn't see it once. It's kicking up a ton of dust, which indicates that it's coming towards us, fast. It's at this point that we start to hear some creepy scratching coming from behind us. We turn to see where it's coming from. It's coming from the burned out caravan, like someone scratching at the wall from the inside. I moved a little closer to try and see what it is, and there was a person in there, peeking out at us from a hole in the damaged wall. Then this childlike voice, that's obviously a grown man imitating a little girl, giggles and says, Are you here to play with me? I looked at my mate to make sure he heard what I heard. He looked back at me with the exact same expression on my face. A clear what the fuck was that. So we booked it back to the extra. We locked the doors and I turned it on. Just as I'm about to reverse out, the other car stops just behind my car with the high beams on. I can't see the driver, but they're in my way so I can't reverse out from where I'm stationed. I have no choice but to drive forward and turn around that way, narrowly missing the staked motel sign. As we're turning to leave, the driver starts blaring the horn, just hammering it for no reason at all. I just sped off back in the direction we came, but the other car doesn't follow. It's getting to twilight at this stage and it's pretty dangerous to be out in these country roads once it's dark. You see, at night, with the headlights on, kangaroos tend to jump in front of cars like deer do and the chances of you hitting it is quite detrimental because it can take you off the road and be potentially deadly. Relieved that we weren't being followed, we're feeling a bit better as we manage to navigate our way back to where we came from, the dino trail, and we even start to joke around about what had happened. The person in the other car was probably just honking at us to get our attention to help with directions or something. 
I pulled into the parking lot and go to the front desk of the company that runs the tours. I explained that we had gotten lost on our way back to the town we were staying at, and the lady there was kind enough to give us some petrol for the ride back. But I couldn't help myself. One of their employees gave us the wrong directions, and I wanted to make a formal complaint. We told her we followed those instructions to a T, so there was no way we messed up the advice he'd given us. And then she gave me this weird look and asked me to describe the guy. I do, and her face turns white. She then says, That man doesn't work here. I saw him talking with the other tourists today, and my boss had to ask him to leave. He kept trying to get the details of where people were staying, and telling them that he had vacancies at his place, and they could stay there. It was called the Moonlight Motel. That brings us to the end of the video. If you liked it, please give the video a like, and if you're new to the channel, subscribe for more stories like this. We also do true crime stories, and we also do some paranormal stuff. So if you like that sort of stuff and want to hear more about Australia and all that scary stuff, make sure you subscribe, hit the notification bell, and you'll get notified when we release a new video. Alright guys, I'm signing off. Thank you so much for everyone who supports all our live streams. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. We appreciate all your comments. I'll see you guys soon. Cheers.